Yep, my name is Poppy Harvey. I'm a data scientist and I'm here to talk to you today about the art of a good chart. Um, so first I'll tell you a bit about myself, um, how I ended up becoming a data scientist and what I do in my job, just to give you an idea of um, what uh, data science is all about. Um, so I studied maths, physics, electronics and technology and design at school. Um, those are my favourite subjects and I took them for a level or the equivalent of hires and advanced hires in Scotland. And then I studied electronic and electrical engineering at university. Um, and then when I finished that, I did a master's degree, which is an extra year um, at university. Um, and I, I did that in data analytics. And that's really where I learned all of the skills I use um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so I work for Scottish Water and have worked there for two years. Um, and as I've said before, my job title is a data scientist. Um, sometimes you'll hear people uh, describe themselves as data analysts. That's um, very similar, pretty much the, the same role, um, but different people use different names. Um, so over 3,000 people work for Scottish Water all over Scotland, the Highlands and Islands, right down to the borders. And there's a lot of different things um, that people in the company do. Um, in my team, um, the business analytics team, all the data scientists, there are around 20 of us. Um, and basically, I use data to help other people in the business answer difficult questions and make big decisions. Um, so I analyze data from lots of different areas of the business. So we have water quality data, we have data about our uh, different machines that we have, like pumps, we have data about our pipes, um, data about uh, the, the maintenance that we do. And I analyze that using programming languages such as R, SQL and Python. So you might have heard of some of those. Uh, don't worry if you haven't, you don't need to know them for this presentation. Um, and then I, so I analyze this data and then I'll write a report and put in graphs and tables to explain um, what I found. And then this helps them make decisions um, to uh, the best and to do the best thing to keep the water flowing. So um, maybe they, they want to know um, which pipes should they repair first so we can help them answer that or which areas are most likely to flood, which uh, treatments should they use at the water treatment work. So uh, all different uh, projects that you could be working on. Um, it's very varied and interesting. Um, so some days I'll set a, a computer most of the day and I'll just write code. I'll work alone, I'll work on a report, um, I'll make nice graphs. Some days I'll be working in a, uh, with my wider team or a smaller group within the team coming up with ideas. Uh, planning out what we're going to do, looking back at what we've done and thinking, did we do a good job? What would we do differently? And some days I will present in front of lots of people um, to show them my results, to, to give them uh, my suggestions, to get information from them about what questions they want answered. So it's really varied, lots of different things and always lots of fun. Um, but my work is only of any value if the people that I present it to understand what I'm telling them um, not everybody um, understands all the nitty gritty statistical methods we use or the machine learning. Um, so I have to make sure that anybody can understand uh, what the data is telling us. Um, so graphs, tables and reports, they need to be clear, informative and appropriate for their audience. And I think this is true across the board. Anybody who works with data um, will need to make sure that they do these things. Um, so. I'm going to give some examples now of some not so good graphs and hopefully some good graphs too, to give you some ideas um, of what you should be doing um, if you're working with data and taking part in the competition. So let's say we wanted to analyze the difference in how much a cheetah sleeps on average each day and how much a chinchilla sleeps on average each day. So luckily I have a data set that tells me these things. So I want to make a graph to show this. So I could make this graph a pie chart, but it's not very useful. I haven't chosen uh, the right sort of graph for what I want to show. So I think uh, one of the first things you need to do is think about what is an appropriate graph for the data you have. So here we have a bar chart. That seems a lot more appropriate um, if we want to compare two things. So we're getting there, but this bar chart isn't very useful because it doesn't have a title or any axes. Um, so it's important that we label 
our graphs appropriately and title them so that people know what they're looking at um, and what the, the axes show. So this is much better. It looks like chinchillas sleep a lot more than cheetahs, but have I been fully truthful with my graph? If we look at the y-axis, we see that I have actually zoomed right in and I don't start it at zero. So it's quite misleading. If we actually look um, with the axis starting at zero and we look at some other animals, chinchillas and cheetahs actually sleep pretty much the same amount each day, around about 12 hours, 12 and a half hours for chinchillas. So it's really important to not be misleading with the data. Um, so here we see I have highlighted cheetahs and chinchillas in some nice colors as well um, to put across that those are the specific animals I'm interested in. Uh, but what if I have this lovely graph now? It's well labeled. Um, it's not misleading. I want to share it with friends. So what if I want to print it off, but I print it in black and white? Well, that's no good. Now we can't see that the cheetah and chinchilla were highlighted in a different color because in black and white, they all look the same. So another thing to take into account is where is this graph that you've made um, or chart going to be displayed? Who's going to use it? So maybe if I change to these colors, then when I print it, if I think people are going to be printing the graph in black and white, we can see the different uh, colors still shine through even in the black and white. I'm not sure if anybody has seen one of these before. You should be able to see the number 74. And if you can't, you might be colorblind. Uh, some people can't see the difference between different colors very clearly, reds and greens, and sometimes blues and purples. So another thing you might want to consider is using a colorblind friendly color palette. Um, if you look online, you can find color palettes like this um, quite easily. Um, and that means that it's much more accessible to everybody. Um, another thing not to do is to try and show everything all on one graph. Um, here I have included all the animals in my data set. I think there are 83 animals, but it's no use. You can't really see because you can see along the bottom, all the names are all squished up and you can't read any of the animals' names and it's just a mess. So think about what's important. What do you really want to show? Do you need to show everything on one graph? Maybe you just choose some of the data to show on the graph and keep the rest in a table. Um, or you, div you split the graph up, maybe you show um, mammals on one graph, fish on one graph, um, insects on another graph, something like that. Here's another example where I've used the same data set, but now we're looking at the relationship between an animal's body weight and the weight of its brain. But I have also used color coding to do with the genus of the animal. First off, have I thought about my audience uh, do we all know what a genus of an animal is? It's so, sort of like the family they, that they belong to, but this is just too much information all on one graph. And it's probably not appropriate for the audience um, because none of us are zoologists or veterinarians. Um, so and now the actual data I want to show is all squished up and really unreadable. And I have this really useless uh, legend here with all these colors that you can't really tell the difference between some of the blues or some of the pinks. So if I take out that and just look at the body weight versus the brain weight, that's a much clearer graph. And then I can talk about the genus of the animals in the, the body of the text in my report is maybe more appropriate than putting it all in the graph like that. Um, so I've also looked online and found some other examples of graphs that I would maybe avoid if I was making a report. So. 3D graphs, it can be really tempting if this is an option in the software you have to, to kind of put everything in, all the options that it allows you to do. But this graph is really hard to read. What is it trying to say? I think it's trying to show how temperatures have changed um, over the last century, depending on the season of the year. But it's just an information overload and you can't really draw any comparisons from it. So um, this is really not the best way to go about displaying that data. Uh, here's another one, a, a 3D pie chart with millions of different cities and uh, states on it. It's poorly labeled. You can't tell the same colors are used for diff uh, the si different uh, states. The, the title is just chart title. This is not a very useful graph. So make sure you don't, again, put too much data on 
or you have different colors for different states or animals, you don't repeat the same colors. So this graph is not useful to anybody. The, this is a graph where somebody's tried to be very clever and they want to show how much money different fast food companies make. So they've used the logo of the fast food company. But while it might look quite snazzy, it's very hard to read. The logos are all different shapes. Also, they don't just get taller, but they also get wider, which can be misleading because maybe you just want to show that something is twice as much. But if you scale up, then the logo will be four times as big. And this person must know that their graph isn't very readable because they've had to add in all the numbers um, as comments with little arrows to each logo. And I think if you have to do that, you should probably think this isn't a good graph. It's not readable. It also doesn't have axes, labels, or a title. So while it might look fun, it's not actually very useful for getting information. And finally, this one I saw, and it made me laugh. Um, it's supposed to be a graph showing the answers to the question, what was the best part of the Super Bowl? Which uh, you may know is the American football uh, sort of championship game at the end of the season. Uh, but the graph says yes or no, neither of which would be answers to the question, what was the best part of the Super Bowl? And also the percentages don't add up to 100. So something's gone wrong here. So just to summarize the key points, um, decide what you want to show. You shouldn't try to show everything on one graph. You can do lots of different graphs, or sometimes it's better to use a table or words. A, a graph isn't always the best option. And don't be misleading with your visualization. So if, you, if you're not starting your axes at zero, for example, make sure that you've made that clear to your audience. Uh, write it in a comment under the graph um, so that you're not trying to trick anybody. And try not to manipulate your data to say something that isn't the whole truth. Sometimes we do analysis and we don't get the results that we wanted. That doesn't mean we should try and uh, exclude information or skew our axes. So it looks like we did get the results we wanted. That's dishonest. Uh, think about your audience. How much do they understand about the subject area? So if we're doing a graph about animals, if it's for five-year-olds, it's going to be very different than if it's for uh, vets and veterinary students. Um, so it's important that it's at the right uh, level of detail and information for your audience. Um, it, use an appropriate amount of detail. Explain any unfamiliar terms or acronyms. So if you've done a lot of research on a topic area, you might be really familiar with all the acronyms and um, terms and words that are used in, in that industry or that subject area, but your audience may not be. So um, maybe if you use an acronym on a graph in the, in the text below, you explain what that is. Um, you can put in a glossary in your report and make sure your plot is labeled um, clearly and your axes are labeled clearly because people need to know what they're looking at. Um, include any units of measurement where appropriate. Um, so that everybody knows if you're looking at thousands of something, grams, kilograms, that sort of thing. Uh, meet, be mindful when choosing your color scheme. As I showed, where will the graph be shown? Is it going to be printed off and photocopied? Make sure if that's the case that the different colors uh, show up clearly on, on black and white. Um, who will be looking at it? Again, uh, think about people who could be colorblind. Um, what do you want to stand out? Do you want to highlight certain parts of the graph, certain uh, bars on a bar chart, slices on a pie chart? Uh, you maybe want to put a, a trend line on a, a graph of um, time-based data. Um, so these are all things to consider. And finally, have fun. I really, really enjoy my job, data science, making reports, making graphs, and sharing that with people. And hopefully, you will too. Um, so you can use bright colors. Um, it doesn't have to be black and blue and boring. Um, make sure you're having fun. Um, so thank you for listening. Uh, does anybody have any questions for me? Thank you so much for that, Poppy, uh, for that fantastic presentation there. Um, it really, really links well um, with the, the, the project that we're running and that the students have to um, to create charts and graphs um, for for their results that they come up with and using infographics as well. So I think that links really well with that as well. I'm just going to start sharing your video as well, if that's okay, yeah. Poppy. 
Um, for those who want to ask some questions, use the Q&A facility at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you want to type in your questions there and I will then read them out to Poppy. Um, I'm just going to start off with a bit of a question for you, Poppy, if that's OK. Yeah. Um, the first one I'm going to ask is, um, do you use kind of charts and graphs on a daily basis within your job? Um, I would say so, yes. Um, the way we work in our job is normally uh, we we work on something for two weeks and then we show it to stakeholders and then they give us feedback and then we go away for another two weeks. Um, that's just how we manage our projects. So um, I would be making graphs um, and working on them every day and then showing them maybe once a fortnight um, to the, the audience that they're intended for. Thank you, Bobby. Um, I think your camera isn't working. Oh, it's not coming oh. up just yet. Don't worry for now. I'll just go on to, oh, there we go. I can see you now. There we go. Brilliant. Um, the next question I was going to ask you is, um, how, how did you get into the field? How did you get into doing your job? Um, so every stage of my life um, towards where I ended up, I always just picked subjects that I really enjoyed. So in school, when I picked my GCSEs, I just picked the ones I really enjoyed and then A-levels. And then that led on to engineering because I really enjoyed technology and design in school. That was my favorite subject. Uh, my teacher said, well, you, you sound like you should be an engineer then. And then on my engineering degree, I really enjoyed all the computer programming classes and all those projects that we did. So I kept doing that um, and then ended up getting a job at the university um, first, um, doing data analysis, looking at uh, how people use electricity in their house. And then I thought, I really, really enjoy this, um, but I want to learn more about it and learn more skills um, specifically about data science so I can um, get an even better job. So then I chose to go and do the uh, data science uh, master's degree. And then while I was doing that, we did um, case studies as part of the degree. So one of our classes, would we would do mini projects for different companies that would come in and tell us about their company and one of those companies was Scottish Water and my now boss came in and spoke to us and set us a task and I thought oh this is really fun and that sounds like a really good company to work for um because I what I really like about Scottish Water is that we do work for everybody in Scotland if you anybody who has a tap who drinks water we're doing something to help you every day um, I like that about my job so really just kept following on doing things that I enjoyed and it led me to where I am now and I think that that's Good advice for anybody just pick the subjects that you enjoy and do the projects that you enjoy and you'll end up doing a job that you really enjoy yeah i think really good advice that for the kind of the young young data professionals that are, that are listening there today as well um is there any kind of um interesting parts of your job that you can remember doing or interesting projects that you've been involved with yeah uh, one of the first projects I was involved with was actually about climate change. Um, so the, the Met Office, you might have heard of, they are the people who do the weather forecasts. So if you ever see the weather on the news, it's probably the Met Office who have um, worked out what the weather is going to be tomorrow or at the weekend. But they also forecast really far into the future um, because they're concerned about climate change and the climate crisis. Um, so one of the things they've done is look at how often we're likely to get really big storms because um, we, we're getting more big storms um, than we, we used to. So uh, what I did as part of a project in, in my work was we looked at how often the Met Office thought we were going to get big storms and we thought, well, how will our network cope with all this rainwater? Where is going to flood? Can, do we need to put extra pipes in certain areas. So that was really interesting because um, you could see that we're looking forward to the future and we are thinking about climate change and being prepared for um, changes that are going to come um, in the next uh, 30 or 50 years. Um, so that was a really fun project to work on. Fantastic. Yeah. So like really interesting field that you've been able to to go into yeah, uh, within, within your job there. Um, is, have, you, have you managed to travel anywhere with your job? Uh, have you stayed uh, kind of based in Scotland? Um, so by the nature of us being Scottish water, it's been mostly in, in Scotland, but um, we have what we call a day in the life, which is a, a big thing in Scottish water where you can go 
and shadow somebody else in the company and see what they do. So we have so many different people doing so many different things all over Scotland. So I've been able to visit treatment works. Um, I went to a sewage treatment works, which actually didn't smell bad. I really thought it would be horrible, but um, it was fine. It, it was a really interesting day to see um, what the, those guys do all day. Um, so that's been good. And another thing that I've been lucky to be a part of is that we have a, a sort of um, friendship with the data science team with another water company in England. So I've been down to visit them and they've been up to visit us and we present our work to each other and we share ideas. Um, so that's been really fun um, to make new friends with them. And there's also been opportunities to visit um, conferences and um, to hear people uh, come from all over the world to speak. Um, so that's been good. So not not too much abroad, um, although there are opportunities within Scottish Water to to go to Australia and Ireland and potentially places in Europe where we also um, work with water companies there um, and help them with their projects. So uh, the opportunities are there. Yeah, good question that links this is at the moment, obviously you can't travel about or anything. Are you yeah. now obviously working at home at the moment? Yes. Um, so for a lot of people, it's been a really big transition to work from home, but um, for me, not so much because um, Scottish Water, obviously, we're based all over Scotland. So we have people in our team. Normally, we have people in Aberdeen, Inverness, Edinburgh, Fife and Glasgow. So video calls um, were really a part of our day to day work. Um, the like the whole time that I've worked there and we have the freedom to work from home. Um, quite often I would normally work from home one or two days a week so now obviously I'm working from home every single day but um, it's very easy to do that when you're a data scientist because um, you're just on the computer most of the time so um, it's not been a difficult transition but obviously I miss seeing all my friends at work um, but they, we've been very good to have catch-ups online and we sent, spend some time each day um, chatting to each other um, and just that normal stuff that you would get around lunchtime and during tea breaks. Um, but uh, yes, I'm currently in my mum's attic, um, which is, uh, I was uh, visiting my mum when the lockdown was announced. So I have been, uh, well, I was supposed to be here for four days and I've been here for over 13 weeks now. Uh, but it's nice to be with my family. Fantastic. That, that's, that's good news that you're still able to work and everything at the moment and still... Yeah do small parts of your job um and yeah. kind the of social parts of your job that's that's really good yeah. as well um with uh, we've got another question here so is there any specific kind of programs you use to make kind of charts or to do yes. your job at all so the software i use uh most is called r which is a programming language which is um, really good for doing statistics um and it's free um you can download that online yourself. Um, if anybody really wants to learn to code in R, it's a really good skill to have. I'm not sure um, if maybe the audience are a bit young, but I mean, I guess you're never too young to start these things. Um, then there's also um, software we use called Power BI, which is a Microsoft product um, for building interactive dashboards and charts. It's very, very cool. Um, I'm not sure how easy it is to get access to that if you're not a company. Um, but those would be the two main tools I would use. Um, but things like Excel also have really um, good facilities for making cool graphs. Yeah, so uh, diff yeah, different ones. And, and, and would you say it's quite good to kind of start learning these these programs as well? Poppy, yeah, uh, I'd say so. The field. Um, yeah, so I started out a long time ago now um, when I was about... 14 years old I um this will be probably uh, completely over the heads of the audience if anyone's heard of MySpace um before you had Facebook you had MySpace and Bebo these were the social networks that people were on um back in the day and you could use uh, programming languages to change the background color on your profile or the fonts so I taught myself to code in a language called HTML you may have heard of um so that I could have a cool looking profile page. And that's what got me sort of interested in programming. So yeah, I was doing that at the age of 14 and I don't think I was the youngest. So absolutely like there's a lot of resources online um, 
to learn things like R and Python and SQL. Um, so go for it. Like if you if you're really interested, yeah, you might as well start learning the skills now, because um, I think there's going to be a lot of uh, jobs and opportunities in this area in the future. Yeah, we've got a question here. Um, I think it goes into a bit more um about your job and and, and it, i think it might be from from an older older listener um here it says what is the best way to carry out thematic analysis um i'm not sure <laughs> is it is it um, i think it goes into a, um, a term i'm familiar with thematic analysis yeah um yeah i think it might be going into a different kind of pathway i think that um within okay. data as well um but i think we can look into that as well uh to, to answer that at a later date um, yeah. Another question I'd like to ask uh, Poppy is, um, are, are there any kind of shocking statistics that you've ever uncovered or researched in your field? Anything that kind of stands out at all? Uh, maybe to do with climate change? Um, I think, yeah, one of the things um, that is quite um, shocking and alarming and uh, maybe not spoken about a lot um, that's relevant to the, the water industry and climate change, it's urban creep, um, which is to do with um, how little by little we take away green areas and green spaces and we cover them with tarmac or patios. So um, not so much um, on a larger scale when we talk about like building uh, a big car park or something, but the little things when people uh, put a patio in their garden or they turn their front garden into a driveway or they rip up a lawn and they put down astroturf which is quite popular now because you don't have to to cut the grass and people don't think about um this effect it's having because they think oh, it's just just my garden but if, if all your neighbors are doing it and all the people in the next town are doing it it's a real problem that's been highlighted especially um in edinburgh and glasgow research has been shown to, uh, to show just how much uh, grass and uh, flower beds and stuff have been lost to this urban creep and it's really going to affect us because as we get these heavier uh, rain uh, storms and stuff that we're expecting to see because of climate change um when you cover a lawn with something like tarmac or a patio or astroturf the the water can't go back into the ground it has to run off somewhere and it ends up either running into the sewers which can't cope with all this water because they were never designed to have to collect all the water because some of the water should go into fields and, and gardens um, and you end up getting flooding in people's houses so I don't have any specific uh, figures but that's um, something that I've come across in, in my work that really shocked me because I hadn't thought about um, you don't think that you just just you putting in a patio or some astroturf is going to have such a big impact but um, if everybody is doing it, then it will have a negative impact. Um, uh, kind of touching on that as well, like around the climate change and areas and to kind of link with your job as well. Uh, we're asking the children, obviously, to, to have a go at our Stat Wars competition. And it's all about climate change. Um, and they have to think of kind of three things that they'd like to change um, and three things they'd like commit to commit to. Um, if, if you were to kind of take in part in the competition, um, are these the sort of things that you've just mentioned then that you would maybe think about when doing the project? Yeah, um, so I'm actually really interested in the environment myself and I have made a lot of changes. Um, so I think uh, one change I'm trying to make is to eat less meat. Um, I haven't gone completely vegetarian or vegan, but I know that um, meat consumption is not good for the environment. Um, so I'm trying to um, have uh, certain days of the week where I don't eat meat and I uh, never have meat for lunch at work because um, that was a kind of an, an easy uh, step to take to just just have vegetarian lunches at work. So that's at least five meals a week where I'm not having any meat. Another thing is trying to buy things without packaging. So um, if you're helping your parents with the shop, um, maybe go see if you can find a zero waste shop near you where you can bring your own uh, tubs and things to fill up or buy vegetables that don't come in plastic packaging things like that and then another change that I have made which um, everybody can do because um, you don't have to do anything you stop doing something is just buy fewer things uh, I set myself the challenge this year to not buy any more than five items of clothing and so far I've bought two I needed to replace a pair of jeans because my jeans had holes and I bought a black skirt. And that's all I bought so far and we're halfway through the year. So those are three changes that I've made um, 
that hopefully will help the climate because in a uh, fashion especially fast fashion is really bad for the environment um so if you buy better clothes or fewer clothes or secondhand clothes or you swap clothes with your friends or your cousins or something that can really help the environment I think that gives some kind of fantastic ideas and I think that'll inspire a few quite a lot of the listeners um, to give them yeah give them some ideas to think about um, for their project that they're working on so thank you very much for that Poppy and for sharing that uh, with us today Um, and I just want to say a big thank you um, for taking time every day to do this for us today and I hope you enjoyed uh, answering those questions from the participants. Yeah thanks for having me Um, I hope everybody enjoys their project and learns a lot of stuff. Yeah, I just want to say a big thank you to everyone who's been listening as well and sending in those questions and uh, and and for taking part today. Um, I hope you've been inspired to take on the Stat Wars competition and use our resources at statwarscompetition.com um, to help you. And please uh, join us for our upcoming interviews as well. I think uh, we'll end it there. Um, really, really good answering of the questions today. So uh, goodbye, everyone. Thank you for that. Bye, everybody.